That's crazy. A Christmas story is 40 years old this year. Hard to believe. 40, and we've seen it every year for 40 years. It, it holds on to itself. How about this one? It's a wonderful life. Huh? 75 years this year. It's a wonderful life. Hard to believe. That's the one I'm going to talk about a little bit. Makes us think of our own struggles. If you know about the story, George Bailey gets depressed. He gets anxious. Something happens. They're in terrible straits. He's contemplating suicide. This is a great Merry Christmas movie. <laughs> so it makes us think about our own struggles with depression and rejection, heartbreak and despair. One part of the movie, he says, I wish I'd never been born. Wow. Didn't somebody try that? Didn't uh, Joe say? Yeah. No. You got in trouble. So anyway. He also says people would be better off without me. What? You ever thought about that? What would what would no. your life or if you weren't here? Like would be that. completely different. Mm -hmm. All those little insignificant events in your life that led you to this point that you don't think about. You know. Uh, if Brenda and I wouldn't have had a, a class together in high school or in the study hall, we wouldn't have talked to each other. This would be completely different. I probably wouldn't be standing here. You think about those insignificant things that you didn't think were important. How did you, you know, her parents came from Tennessee up here. How did that happen? Because that happened, she happened. Because she happened, I happened. You know, and my family is the same way. That was little things. How did they meet? How did they, where would your life be without all of those? that you are, so that's what we've been given. Strange, isn't it? Each man's life touches so many others. When he isn't around, he leaves an awful hole, doesn't he? That's a, that's a line from It's a Wonderful Life as well. Clarence the Angel said that. We were created for an eternal, abundant, and yes, a wonderful life. But we must be aware that there's a battle raging over each of us. An enemy that wants nothing more than for us to live in darkness and to steal away that life that God desires for us. But take heart. Jesus defeated our foe on the cross, and the message is that the life of the world has won. Sure, we will endure tests and trials, and we will overcome but we will overcome knowing that we are a part of the greatest story and our God is guiding our lives in such a way that we fulfill the purpose for which he created us. Romans 8, 28, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Yeah, it's tough. Sometimes the holidays are harder on some people. But it's a wonderful life. Let us bow before our Heavenly Father. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, my throat cleared. Yeah. Heavenly Father, lower. We worship you and thank you, Lord, that David will bring the word to us this morning. We have this holiday season, the time to thank you for sending your son to this earth. <clears throat> May we glorify your name and the Lord's name. May we look to you and rid our minds of the problems of life and enjoy this holiday season little children reminding us of your son. <clears throat> we praise you. Now, Lord, may everything we do be for your glory and your praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Um,
So the songs today, knowing that we are going to be shorthanded, if you will, are older songs, you know them, but I want to hear them. And they may get direct faster than what you like. Okay, good. <laughs> you teach me singing, it doesn't matter how many are here. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. <clears throat>
lyrics to mm -hmm. the hymn we just sung paints a very vivid picture of the life of our Savior. And it gives us a, you know, as you read a book, you get those mind pictures. I think we've got the same thing with, with that selection. The most important part of that selection, though, is the refrain. Write on my heart every word. And we do know that if we can ingest that and keep, keep that story within ourselves, we can surround this table knowing full well what Jesus came to this earth to do. The God of all creation, a small child, helpless, vulnerable, needy, a young man who's learning a trade, then a preacher, teaching, performing wondrous miracles to confirm the word that he is preaching. Being a servant of many. <coughs> As we're studying in the book of Mark, we're, we're, we're looking at all those things that Jesus did for the people of that time period. Healing the sick, multitudes of the sick, casting out demons who recognized him and yet he hushed them. He shut them up. Raising the dead. Comforting those who were hurting. A servant. As we partake of the emblem that represents his body. He was crucified and, and killed because of our sin. The Lamb of God which takes away sin of the world. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we thank you so much. Words just don't seem enough to give you the recognition of what you have done for your creation and for all mankind. Knowing full well that many would accept and obey and many would reject and shun you. But your love exceeds anything that we can comprehend. We ask your blessings now upon this emblem. That as we partake of it, we can focus fully on your sacrifice. And the promises that you have given to us. And we pray this in your high and holy name. in the lyric, tell of the cross where they nailed him. Driving <coughs> in anguish and pain. We can picture the Savior on the ground, arms outstretched as the soldiers put the nails in his hands and his feet. And the pain that radiated through his arms and his feet. I think writhing was a very appropriate word for that. It has been known to bring a tear to the eye of man as we picture our Lord and Savior going through all that just for us. 
Lord, we can only imagine the amount of pain that you had to go through to, to save us. But we were thankful for your sacrifice, for your strength, for your example. And we pray that as we go through life, as your children, as your brother, that we would have the stamina to withstand the anguish and the pain that comes with life, but also rejoice in knowing full well that we can look past that, just as you did, for the glory that was set before you and the glory that you promised and set before us. We ask your blessings on this cup and the purification which comes from coming in contact with your blood. And we pray this in your holy name. Amen. might own a house, a job, but we have them for a short time period and then we either leave or we get another. And that goes on until we ourselves finally go to our reward. And then who's will be The gospel is entrusted to each and every one of us. And we are to share it and to give it to those who are willing to listen and to obey. The trick is finding who wants to listen. Then we leave it up to them. They wish to obey. We come together each first day of the week to do all these things. But our giving is actually based on helping establish the gospel in the lives of many, whether locally or worldwide. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for you blessing us with the material things of life, especially the means by which we are able to uh, be supported. And we pray that as we have uh, been giving the stewardship of what you have blessed us with, that we would use it to give you the honor and the glory and the praise that is so to you. We pray your blessing upon uh, the monetary gift that we're about to give, or that we have given, that it would be used to enrich the lives of those who do not know you. And we pray this in Christ. Bible classes may be dismissed at this time.
peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, and hating one another. Please be seated. Well, again, good morning to you, church, to our members and guests. And a special thank you to Joe for filling in last week. I really appreciate it. And I'm sad that I happened to be sick on my Sunday off, but that's okay. I'm just glad to be able to be up here and, and uh, bring the word to you guys this morning. A Merry Christmas to you, and if you do end up traveling this afternoon, I wish you and pray for your safe, uh, safe travels and a wonderful Christmas time with friends and family, wherever you might find yourself this year. We are nearing the end of our study of the Holy Spirit this morning. We have one, maybe two, maybe three or four. We, you never know with me. We might get carried away. But we're, we're starting to wrap this thing up. And I hope that this study on the Holy Spirit has impacted your life and walk with the Lord. That is the objective after all. We, we have hopefully been challenged along the way to consider what God has done through the Holy Spirit to help you succeed and flourish as a follower of Jesus. That is God's objective for you, is to be successful and to flourish as a disciple, as a follower of Jesus, as a Christian. That's what he wants for you. Now there is still so much that we could say about this topic concerning the Holy Spirit, and perhaps we'll revisit again sometime in the new year, but we are for the time being wrapping this thing up. And perhaps along the way, as we've discussed a number of different topics pertaining to the Spirit, maybe it's brought up more questions that you might have. Uh, it's, it's, again, something we don't talk about fairly, fairly frequently, so maybe it's brought up some questions that you'd like to have answered. And if that's the case, I would highly encourage you to share with me what your thoughts are and what questions you might have so we can bring those things up at a later time. When I read about the fruit of the Spirit, as we've just read a moment ago, my mind often drifts back to that really good book, John. Spent a lot of time there. And, and Jesus had some things to say about fruitfulness that I think tie in very well with our topic today. You might recall Jesus' words in John chapter 15 where he says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. <coughs> when we consider fruitfulness, as followers of Jesus, whatever form that might take. And in every case, our fruitfulness is absolutely dependent on the presence of God in our lives and our closeness to Him. There's a direct correlation in those things. Fruitfulness does not occur apart from being close to God and God being close to us. This is the case in John 15 as well as in Galatians 5 as we've just read. The fruit that is born in us is a fruit that is born because of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is just as the name implies. These are things that are born out by the Spirit and not created by us. They're born out in us, but not by us. I think of the illustration of a, a pot of water that's on the stove top. What is it that makes the water boil? Does the water decide for itself I'm just going to boil up and I'm going to flow over the sides and make a mess all over the kitchen? Or is there something that's present with the water that causes that water to simmer and then boil and then overflow over top of your, your stove top? The water boils because of the power of the heat being applied to it. And this functions much in the same way in the life of a Christian with regard to the Spirit. When we think about the fruit of the Spirit, I want to talk a little bit about the fruit that's actually produced in us. Let's look at what the Spirit has to say about the fruit He produces. What does the Spirit produce in us? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You got such things, there are no law. You'll notice here, when we see this word fruit at the very beginning, that it is in what's called the singular and not the plural. 
This is a fruit of the Spirit. These things are the fruit of the Spirit. And this clues us in on something regarding the nature of these things. There is one fruit born in the believer's life by the Spirit, and it's composed of many different things. These things come as a package deal in the life of a believer and not, or they come as a package deal and as a unit and not as individual things. One who is keeping in step with the Spirit and the Spirit is bearing His fruit in their life will not have just one or maybe a couple of these things present in their life, but these will all be developing to one degree, to one degree or another. They will not have, let's say, love at the expense of patience or kindness. They will not have self-control at the expense of gentleness or faithfulness. All of these things will be present when the, the Spirit is bearing fruit in the believer's life. Now granted, some of these areas may be stronger than others. Some might need some more development. But they will all be present to one degree or another. Not only are these things going to be produced in someone who walks with the Spirit, we might be able to say that there are even evidences that somebody is in fact walking with the Spirit. If someone were to question if they were walking with Him or not, the presence and development of these things would serve as a sort of a diagnostic for them. If it's a question in your mind, if, if you're walking with the Spirit or not, and you look and you see, well, these fruits are not a component of my life, well, some alarm bells might be going off. And the other side is also true if you say, well, I'm, I'm not sure if I really am or not, but boy, I've really come a long way in this last year. I've, I've been a whole lot more loving and patient kind and gentle with people than I was last year. I feel like I've grown in all those areas. That should serve as a diagnostic green flag that, that something good is going on in your life. <coughs> that being said, remember that growth, regardless of how small or slow it may seem to you, is still growth. I think sometimes we're quick to, to see very slow growth and just dismiss it as like nothing happened at all. But slow growth is still growth. It may seem small and insignificant to you or maybe even to outsiders looking at your life. But in reality, it may be a monumental change in the right direction, even though it doesn't look like much. I think about those who are trying to, to quit some kind of a bad habit whether it's a simple one or otherwise just something, something is out of hand in their life. They want to get a hold of it. They want to quit this habit, whatever it is. And it might be the case that they engage in this particular habit, let's say, 20 times a day. They come to know Jesus. They love him. They desire to grow to be more like him. They desire to follow him more closely. They have the spirit in their life. And so they decide they're going to commit to trying to give up whatever this habit is and go in the right direction. And so they struggle and they fight against it. As if you've ever had to kick a habit, you know how hard that can be. They struggle and fight against it. And guess what? Sometimes they fail. But they've engaged in the habit 15 times instead of 20. Is that not a step in the right direction? They're not on the side of this thing that they want to be. They haven't kicked the habit completely, but they're going in the right direction. They have grown in self-control. Is their success as limited as it might appear, not because of the Spirit convicting and converting them to a better way of life? Is the Spirit involved with their success as small as limited as it might seem to everybody? Food for thought. Remember that the flesh is still waging war against this person, but now they have the Spirit helping them in the fight. We have the fruit of the Spirit, the good things that the Spirit bears out in our life. There's evidence that He's working in our life. We should look for these sorts of things, this love, joy, peace, patience, etc. But we also have to be mindful of the fact that there are other things going on that we, we have to be mindful of. We are waging a war against our own flesh. We have the works of the flesh to contend with, 
that as we read, the Spirit is waging war against it. Our flesh is waging war against the Spirit. So what does that mean for us? That means we're probably going to have some setbacks. We're going to mess up. But there's still a fight being fought we need to, to be engaged in. Let's look at these works of the flesh once more. Paul says, now the works of the flesh are evident. These are things that you can see. They're readily discernible. And you know what they are when you see them. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry. That's making something into God that is not God. Sorcery, enmity, strife, and jealousy. We know what those things are, right? That's, that's the butting of heads and the fights and consternation that comes from it. Fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, in contrast to the fruit produced by the Spirit, we have really what we produce all on our own. We don't need help to do these things. We have a natural inclination to, to engage in these sorts of behaviors. Uh, not necessarily all of them, but uh, we're, we're good at figuring out how to sin all on our own. These are things that are produced in those who are not, certainly not born of the Spirit. But even those who are, let's say, born of the Spirit, but not being led by the Spirit or keeping in step with the Spirit. These things can happen. A person born of the Spirit can refuse to be led or keep in step with Him resulting in somebody going back to some of these kind of behaviors. And I want to look at this list a little more carefully with you and highlight a few, a few things. Notice the phrase towards the end there where Paul says, and things like these. <clears throat> Paul is not being exhaustive in his list of things that are waging war against the flesh. These are, he leaves the door open for his readers to say, oh, I can think of something else that, that might fit with me. He leaves the door open for us to, to find where we fit into this picture. This is not an exhaustive list, and we could find all kinds of things to add to it that might describe us in some way. Yeah. You might look at this list, and you may see something on this list that you would never actually do. You might see something on this list that you would never actually do, but maybe you'd like to if you had the chance. Perhaps you see something on the list that you're still struggling with right now, maybe even today. Whether it's something like jealousy or envy or something like that. I want to draw our attention to another important word in this text. The word do, towards the end of verse 21. That those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom. It's important that we define our terms here. The word do does not mean that you messed up and sinned in a particular way one time and now you're done for it. Now, this is an instance where I think that the ESV translation of the Bible uh, could have done a better job. The word do means that this sinful activity is a present and welcome addition to your way of life. Not that you just messed up in a particular way. The better word that your translation might use here is practice. That those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom. What do you think of when you hear that word practice? Practice is intentional and repetitive. If you've ever learned an instrument or learned to play a particular sport or something like that, practice means you've invested some serious time and energy into becoming more proficient at whatever that activity is. Those who practice these things, they say, this is a welcome piece of my life. I don't like doing this. I want to keep it around. I'm going to propagate it, use it to my advantage. Those are the individuals we're looking at here. These are people who are not, whose life is not kingdom oriented, but carnally oriented. They live to serve themselves rather than the cause of Christ. But just because you might sin in one of the ways that are listed here, and none of these sins are like good things. We're in agreement with that. We don't want to want to do those things. But even if you struggle against one of these things on this list here, it doesn't mean that the Spirit cannot or does not continue to work in your life. 
In fact, if you find yourself struggling against sin, which honestly, we all should be struggling against sin, right? It's still present in our life. We want to fight against it. Know that the Holy Spirit, through Paul, gives us some incredible words of encouragement to help us overcome these sins. Let's go back to the beginning of our text and see if we can find it together. What does Paul say? What does the Holy Spirit tell Paul to write down for Christians of all generations to look back to and know for certain that would give them comfort? What I say, walk by the Spirit, and what? If you will not, you might not, you could not, but you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Because you're not going to give in to whatever those sinful desires are. If, what? You walk by the Spirit. If you walk by the Spirit, then you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. So if you are struggling against some desire of the flesh, and you're struggling to overcome it, where's the solution? It's in keeping in step with the Spirit. <laughs> keeping in step with the Spirit. When you think about your walk with the Lord, does it occur to you? Think about this. When you think about your walk with the Lord, does it occur to you that he wants you to be successful in walking with him? Think about that for a second. God wants you to be successful in your walk with him. Think about the fact that he wants you to thrive and to flourish as one of his followers. That's, that is his desire for you. This is the outcome that he wants for you, to be able to overcome sin and to walk with him more closely. I often wonder if our general aversion to speaking, of the, speaking about the Spirit in the church has hindered many of us from being able to actually overcome our sin and develop more and more as a follower of Christ. If we're afraid to talk about the Spirit, what it means to walk with Him and live with Him and have Him lead our lives, we don't talk about that. And that's the key to overcoming sin and growing as a Christian. What's going to be the result? Weak Christians. Unempowered Christians. Just something to think about. I get the impression that sometimes we see God as this, this angry judge waiting to strike us down at any moment. Waiting for you to mess up and bring the hammer down. I, I get that impression that sometimes we, we think about God in this way. It's as though we hear him say, well, here's the standard. And you have to meet it. Don't mess up. Do better. Sometimes that's, let's be honest, sometimes I think that's how we look at God. Now it is true that there is a standard that we're called to. And, and as Christians, those who profess to follow Christ, we must strive to put off and avoid sin. And we must strive to become more like Jesus. That's doing really better, right? But it's also true that this is a process that we go through. Not with God as the angry judge glaring down at us, waiting to strike us, but with God, the helpful and optimistic Father urging us forward. It's a very different perspective on God. We need to be able to hear God saying, here is the standard. But I want you to succeed in getting closer to that standard. I've given you the help of the Holy Spirit to convict you and prompt you to follow more closely. I want to encourage you and bestow grace and peace upon you when you fail. I've given you the support of other people who are going through the same process. That's you, church. I've given you a promise that if you live your life in tune and in step with my Holy Spirit, you will be successful. What does verse 16 say? Walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. When you knit your life so closely to the Spirit of God, you won't have time, nor will you have desire, to fulfill the lusts of the flesh. We talked about this a few times, how that concept of displacement with the buck game and the grandkids. You love the buck but the, the new grandbabies being born into the world, you're going to forego the buck and go see your new grandbaby. When we're in tune with the, the Spirit, walking with the Spirit, being led by the Spirit, everything else is going to be pushed to the side in, in importance. 
you won't have time or desire to gratify the lust of the flesh. Your desire for the Lord will exceed any desire that you have for sin. Your life is going to be so filled with the fruit of the Spirit being born out in your life that you're going to be too busy loving and serving people that you just won't have time to get involved with sin. <coughs> You've heard the phrase, idle hands are the devil's playthrough. When you're busy living your life in step with the Spirit, you're going to be busy loving and serving people. And that idleness will never have a chance to set in. So we talked about the fruit of the Spirit. We talked about what we're looking out for, the, the works, the flesh that we're contending against. We talked about the fact that God has given us the Spirit so that we can be successful in overcoming all of those things. And so maybe you're hearing all this and you're asking a question like this. What do I do now? How do I bring this into my own life so I can move forward with the Spirit? <clears throat> Maybe you've heard all this and you've decided on two great things. Number one, I want the Spirit to bear His fruit in my life. And if you're a Christian, you ought to be in full agreement with that statement. And the second is this, I want to walk with Him so that I can overcome the sin that still remains in my life. Again, another statement that should be true if you're a Christian. And if that is you, that is wonderful. And so then you might be asking, how do I get this kind of closeness with the Spirit so that these things actually happen in my life? That He bears His fruit in my life and that I can overcome sin. How do I go about doing that for me? <coughs> First, if you have not been born of the Spirit, that's where you need to start. If you have not been brought into the family of God and given the gift of the Spirit, if you're not a part of God's family and been born again, that's where you need to start. Jesus talks about being born of the Spirit in John chapter 3. Unless you're born of water and the Spirit, you cannot see, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. We must be born of the Spirit. Paul talked about being raised up out of that watery grave we reference every week. That grave of baptism, that we rise up out of it to a newness of life when we are born again in Romans chapter 6. Peter talked about receiving the gift of the Spirit after our baptism in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. It's one of our favorite verses. And so if you need to receive the Spirit, as well as a new life in Christ, we're ready to help you obey that command and be baptized this morning, that you can receive the Spirit and start that walk. If you have already committed your life to Christ in this way, and desire the things that we've discussed today, a closer walk with the Spirit, and his fruit being born in your life. Here's what you should do. Let the Spirit rule your life. Think about that. Let the Spirit rule your life. What does that look like? Spend time with him. I, don't, I, I often wonder if we don't really think about the Spirit in our day-to-day -day activities. Spend time with him. Acknowledge his presence. Talk with him. Bring him into your decision-making processes. We have to make a lot of decisions, don't we? Bring him into the process. Talk about him to other people. Read the word that he has given you. You got a Bible? If you need one, we'll get you one. Read the word he's given you. Rely on him. That's what it means to have the Spirit rule over your life. It's just like any other relationship that you want to grow in. You have to devote time and effort into growing that relationship. Best friends don't become best friends if they never talk to each other, right? That makes sense. <laughs> have you ever noticed that when you spend a considerable amount of time, quality time, with a particular person or persons, that you start to pick up some of their traits, some of their mannerisms, and things that make them a little weird, they, they get weird because they're hanging out with you. Maybe I'm the only one, weird one here, but Mike, you're with me. I know you're on me. Husbands and wives, best friends are great places to look. When you spend a considerable amount of quality time together, they start to homogenize their, their characteristics with time. They become more like each other because they've devoted that kind of time together. And so as you spend more time with the Spirit, guess what? You're going to become more like Him. And we see that when we bear His fruit in our lives. Here's my challenge for us, church. We think about the new year. We have that new year, new week thing coming up. A lot of people do. I want us to commit to this together. 
as a church, and individually. We want to walk by the Spirit. We want to be led by the Spirit. We want to bear His fruit. We want to live by the Spirit and keep in step with the Spirit. If you look back at our text today, you'll see each of these phrases pop out. These are our objectives, church. So let's work together along with the help of the Spirit to grow in each of these ways. In the let's commit to allowing the Spirit to play a more centralized and central role in our lives and in the life of the church. <coughs> and if you need some encouragement or support to help get back on track in some way that will help you do this better, or if you need to begin your new life in Christ this morning, we're ready to help you however we can. If you have any needs this morning, if you have questions you want to talk later, let me know. But we hope that you'll come forward as we stand and sing. Oh, God. 